We've got a lot of ground to cover tonight. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. We'll begin in verse 14. And I'm trying to get all of this covered before the Bible Bowl. And it's hard to do, isn't it, Lillian? We covered a lot of material in our class this morning. There's just so much. We've got to do this, and we still have chapter 11 to go, which we'll be doing next Sunday night. So there's just a lot that we need to be uh, looking at. And I've titled this, The Miracles of Jesus. That's what really Matthew chapter eight and nine are about. There's some teachings in there, but very largely it's one miracle after another. And the nature of these miracles is what I was trying to point out, that, that every one of them is special and reveals something. And they're in all kinds of situations, some in private, some in public, some among strangers, some there, um, uh, among very close to him, some he touched, and some he wasn't even in the area. He just spoke the word, and they found out they were healed when he spoke it, even though he wasn't there. So they cover everything to show that these things are, are real, genuine miracles. We'll continue that through Matthew chapter 9, but when we get into Matthew chapter 10, it's the limited commission. And that is when Jesus sends his 12 out to preach. And I'm going to show you something here. He doesn't send the 12 into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. In Matthew chapter 10, he says, go not to the Gentiles, but go to the house of Israel. He told them don't even go to Samaria. But go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it shows us Jesus' mission here is really among the Jews. It's going to be the apostles that carry the gospel into all the world. And most of what Jesus does is right among his own people. And then he's going to give them miraculous powers to accompany their preaching and give them some instructions for that limited commission. As it is a limited commission, well, it has a limited application to us. Oh, there's lessons we can learn from this. But the things he is telling them is really for that limited commission and not the great commission that we're a part of now. And so things are a little different there. All right. Now, let's start Matthew chapter 9 and verse 14. Before we get that, the memory verse. You got one memory verse. Y'all will be able to get the memory verse, okay? One memory verse. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Just one verse. So memorize that, and you'll get the first four questions, first four things right then. There'll be four blanks in that memory verse come Wednesday night. All right? Now let's go to Matthew 14. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast. No man put a piece of new cloth into an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine in old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine in new bottles, and both are preserved. Fasting. The, the disciples of John did this. And the Pharisees did this. And it was the idea that through fasting, we could become more righteous. That's what the Pharisees thought. And, and remember how Jesus said, when you fast, wash your face and, and don't appear in the men to fast. But the Pharisees, they liked men to see them fast because that made everybody think they were more righteous. And so it was just kind of customary. Well, we fast, but they know that, well, the disciples of, of Jesus, they don't fast. They're not doing this to look so righteous like we are. 
And so why don't your disciples fast? Well, Jesus explained it three ways. Uh, when you go to the wedding feast, that then the bridegroom is there, it's a time to rejoice. You, you wouldn't fast during a wedding feast. You, you wouldn't go to a wedding feast and say, no, I'm fasting. And just, and, no, that's a rejoicing time. And so you would eat with everyone. Now, when the bridegroom leaves, then, then there'll be time for fasting. And so Jesus is depicting himself as the bridegroom among his disciples. And now was their time to rejoice in him. He would leave and the fasting could come later. Number two, you take an old garment. You don't put a new cloth on an old garment. Now, we might do that, I mean, because our garments are a little different than theirs. That, their garments, a lot of them be made out of wool. You know what wool does? It draws together over time. And you take a, a new piece of wool and try to patch an old piece of wool with it, and that new patch, it'll draw together, and it'll pull that old wool all to pieces. You just don't do that. And I tell you what, Jesus wasn't here to patch up a bunch of old customs that were out of date and that were passing away. And he wasn't here to just patch up the old law. He's bringing in a new covenant. Now I described it a third way and about putting new wine in old bottles. Now don't think of glass bottles, don't, don't think that. No, their bottles were made of, uh, well we say they were made of skin, but really they're made of stomachs. I mean, they'd take a lamb or, or a goat and they'd, slay the, and they'd save the stomach. And they could tie off one end and then and put all the contents in there and tie off the other end. And, and that way, see, what you put in the bottle would be separated from the oxygen and it would be preserved. Now, you couldn't do that with an old bottle. Uh, if you tried that with an old bottle, you took an old skin, you never could tie it off real good. It, it would, you, you, you just couldn't get it sealed. It'd be kind of like having a jar when you, when you can your vegetables and, and one of the lids don't seal. Well, that, that's going to ruin, isn't it? And that's what would happen if you tried to put new wine in an old bottle. It's not going to be preserved. Oh, there's so much here. Yet a lot of people talk about, well, we ought to be able to drink. Jesus turned water into wine. And, and if he could drink, tell, give people alcohol, we ought to be able to drink. Well, it, wine does not mean alcohol. This wine that they are putting into these bottles was new wine. It had not turned to alcohol. Now, if they put it in an old bottle and tried to seal it up, why, it would. It, it would ferment and, and the air pressure would grow in there and it would grow and it would burst that skin and uh, that they would lose the wine and the bottle. You put the new wine in there, the fresh, sweet wine that's not alcoholic, and you seal it up, you couldn't seal it. People say, well, they couldn't preserve wine back then, because they, they couldn't keep it refrigerated. I tell you, you go to the grocery store, go and look at the grape juice, and it's not refrigerated, is it? It's sealed up in a bottle. And that's what they did. They sealed it up in these skin bottles, these stomach bottles, so it was preserved. So they could preserve it. Don't tell me they couldn't. That was the whole point Jesus is making. But what is he saying about all this here? He's saying this. Don't try to fit the new gospel into your old customs. Why, the Jews had taken that old law and they had developed all their traditions and customs about that old law. In fact, they would hold to their customs even more than the law. You're not going to be able to do that with the gospel. The new gospel is not, you can't fit that and make that work in an old law, in the old customs, you see. That's what Jesus is teaching. See how it's going to be hard to get through all this? Let's go to the next one. Here it is. John 9, 18 and 19. While he spake these things, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshiped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead. But come and lay thy hand on her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. This ruler is not that centurion that said, come heal my servant. And you don't, you don't have to come. Just give the word. That's not what the ruler here did. He said, come to her. She just died. But if you lay your hands on her, she'll live. Well, 
I tell you, father pleading for his daughter, our Lord, our God is a God of compassion. He saw our sorrows. He said, I'll come. Now on his way, he performs another miracle. Here's what happened. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years. Oh, she had been sick a long time. 12 years she's dealt with this problem. She came behind and touched the hem of his garment. You know, if someone were to touch the hem of my coat, I wouldn't know it. I wouldn't know they touched it. But Jesus knew when he was touched by the hem of his garment. Here's what she said within herself. If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. Jesus turned about and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. After 12 years, because she believed and reached out and touched that garment. And now she's whole. Well, the other accounts tell more into this. And I wish I could just bring the whole lesson on it. You know, it said she spent all her substance and uh, had suffered many things at the hand of her physicians. Boy, we can relate to that, can't we? This medical care is expensive and it hurts. And sometimes the cure is as bad as the disease. And that's what she had dealt with. And, and other things about this story, but we're going to keep moving on. But he did that on the way. Now, here's what happens. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said to the again, give place for the maid is not dead but sleeping. The minstrels. See, here's, here's, they had funeral customs. And it might sound kind of strange to us, but they would actually hire professional mourners. Now, what we get people to come sing at the funeral, you know, we're going to come sing at the funeral, and, and we do that. But what they do, they get people to come and, and be the mourners at the funeral. Come, would you come be the mourner? We got to go mourn. And they'd go, and oh, they'd act like it was so off. And their job was to, to mourn, you know, and show pity and all this, and kind of create that whole mood about the the I know that sounds a little strange to us, but that's what they would do. That's who these minstrels were making the noise. Well, Jesus said, now watch how, how this just, they were so rude, these mourners. It said, Jesus said, give place for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. Now, it, when you go look at someone in a casket, it looks like they're asleep. Well, their body is at rest. The, the soul lives on. But the body is at rest. And that's what Jesus was referring to. But she's not dead and gone because Jesus is going to raise her again. But look what these mourners do. They laughed him to scorn. Now that wasn't their job. Their job was to mourn. But instead of mourning, what are they doing? They're laughing at him. Now, I've done some foolish things, I, and, and people have gee-hawed, laughed at me until I felt so ashamed of myself, and I didn't like that. Have you ever had anybody treat you that way? You do something, and they just laugh, and they're not laughing at, with you or, or having fun. They are laughing at you until you just feel so humiliated, and... Jesus knows how you feel now when that happens. They laughed him to scorn. And they were supposed to be mourning. Well, when he put the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand and the maid arose. Look who got the last laugh that time. And the fame of uh, uh, him went abroad into all the land. And so people are learning about Jesus. Let's go to the next one. Matthew 9, 27 through 31. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Now it doesn't sound like he healed them right away. They're following him, saying this. 
Okay, people are hearing this and they say, okay, here's two blind men and they're making this noise. So there's a lot of attention given to this now. Well, they followed him right on in the house. When he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said unto them, believe ye that I'm able to do this. And they said unto him, yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. Now, if they didn't believe, they wouldn't have been able to see. Say, according to your faith, be it unto you. That's what he said. He didn't say see. What did they believe he could do? Well, we know what they believed by what happened next. They believed he could make them see. Look what happens. Their eyes were opened. Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread and brought his fame into all that country. Now, he told them not to do that. I just wonder, how did he expect them not to? I mean, what would you have done if you were blind and now you could see? How could you not just, people, I, I thought you were blind. <laughs> how could you not just tell everyone the good news? Yeah, and yet we sometimes have trouble telling the good news about salvation. And here they're talking about just being able to see with their eyes. They spread that news abroad. But why did Jesus tell them not to tell everyone? I'll tell you what was more important than the miracles of Jesus. And that's the teachings of Jesus. Jesus wanted the attention on what he was teaching. And it's easy to get all wrapped up in the miracles of Jesus and not pay attention to his teaching. And so that may be one of the reasons he's telling, now don't, don't spread that. What they need to be talking about is what I'm teaching, not these miracles I'm doing. The miracles confirm the teaching. And so the teaching is paramount, but they couldn't help it. They went out, they told everyone and who among us probably wouldn't have done that? But still, they really should have done what Jesus said about that. But we understand that, don't we? All right. Matthew 9, 32 through 34. And as they went out, behold, they brought unto him a dumb man possessed with the devil. Now, we know what dumb means, don't we? This is not that he was some kind of imbecile. By dumb, that means he could not speak. The devil had taken his voice away. So the dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled. He caused the, he, the dead to rise from the, he, the, the bed of death. He brought them back from the dead. He made the blind to see. He made the dumb to speak. The Pharisees said, he casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. See, the prince of the devils would have authority over the devils. And since Jesus has authority over devils, they're saying, well, he's relying on the prince of the devil. Those Pharisees, they were not going to believe in spite of the evidence. They're looking for some reason not to believe, aren't they? And this is going to come up again now about how Jesus has power over demons. And we'll see this develop as we go through the book of Matthew. But there's the idea the Pharisees had. It's coming from the prince of the devils. Let's go to the next one. See how much we got to cover and learn? You're going to have a study hard for this test coming up Wednesday, all right? Now, <coughs> Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. I just want you to remember that. Jesus was moved with compassion on us. We're part of those multitudes. You ever look out over the multitudes and just your, the, the, the awful condition of mankind. Uh, it's easy to turn on the TV and, and get mad at the fools that they put on TV and it? all the riots and the carrying on, but Jesus would see that and he would have compassion on them. Those poor people don't know any better than to behave this way and to act this way and, and, and they need this help. And Jesus was moved with compassion. And 
because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers into the harvest. There's just so much work to do. Now this introduces chapter 10. Because in chapter 10, he's gonna take those 12 and send them out into this harvest. Okay, are we ready for that? Let's go. I, you can really divide it in two, but after this first little section where he calls his disciples, the rest of this goes together. And if nothing else, I'll read it tonight so we get through it. But there's so much there, we're just gonna have to hit the tops of the surface. All right, I may come back and revisit this sometime when we go into it in, in more depth and, and see all the beautiful things that are therein. But first, of all these disciples, he's gonna pick 12. And we've got their names. Here's your memory verse, and then here's the disciples. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the two there, that means verse two. It's Matthew 10, two through four. Oh, I didn't bring my Dr. Pepper bottle. I should have done it. I've got one at home. You, you know when you're supposed to drink Dr. Pepper, don't you? At 10, two, and four. That's, that's when, you remember the little clock on the Dr. Pepper bottle? And, and downtown there's an old sign they keep repainting. It's got that little circle. It's got 10, 10, two, and four. Lori was watching something about some lady in the nursing home that lived to be 100, and they said, how'd you live to be 100 years old? She said, well, I drank Dr. Pepper three times a day. I mean, isn't that what the doctor said to do? Drink it at 10, two, and four. And so maybe if we'd all do that, you know, it, we could do it. But that was sort of the prescription. Now take it three times a day at 10, two, and four. Well, when you see Dr. Pepper, I want you to remember, it's Matthew 10, two through four where we find the names of the 12 apostles, okay? Now here they are. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew and Thomas and Matthew the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus. And then here's this fellow named Lebaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus. In the book of John, he's called Nathaniel. Okay, he has three names. Nathaniel, Lebaeus, and Thaddeus. Now, when I was a little boy, and we'd sing the apostles, he, I thought that was Thaddeus. So I thought, well, Lebaeus, he was the big fat apostle. You know, he was the Thaddeus. Well, <laughs> little children, I think, think, you know, and it's interesting what little children pick up sometimes. But it doesn't talk about how much he weighed here. That's not what it is. It's P-H, Thaddeus, not the fattiest, okay? I mean, we used to call people fatty, you know, so we thought, well, he was the fattiest. <laughs> Made sense, didn't it? But that's not what it is. Okay, he is, uh, Lebaeus was surnamed Thaddeus. And then there's Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And that story is to come. Okay? He doesn't betray him now, but he's going to betray him later. Matthew's writing this after that betrayal, you see. Now, here is the instructions Jesus gave, and I think we're gonna have time to cover this, but there's a lot to it. Here's what he said. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, here's the limited commission, go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, this is a commission that's limited to Israel. Now, it tells them what to preach when they go out there. Here's, what your, here's your sermon. As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. 
That's what Jesus was teaching. And that's what the 12 apostles were to go forth and teach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, he gave them power to confirm that message. Here's what they do. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely have ye received, freely give. He's going to give them this gift and they are to bestow this gift among men. The purpose is to confirm their preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat. In other words, this, this is a job to do, and people ought to be able to support you and, and take care of you and provide for you as you provide them these spiritual things. He goes on, he says, and into whatever city or town you shall enter, inquire in it who is worthy. That's who, who is worthy to take care of them. That'd be some man of, somebody of some substance that, that has a reputation. That, they'll look after you while you pray. They'll take care of you. Inquire who that would be. And then it says, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake the dust off your feet. They weren't worthy. Just take, don't even tear the dust with them. It says, take the dust off your feet. Verily I say unto you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Okay, there's a day of judgment coming. That's a given here. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know what happened to them. Fire and brimstone fell from heaven. And they were all consumed. And yet in that day of judgment, everyone there is going to be judged. And it'll be more tolerable for them than you, than, than those cities reject you. Why is that? You know, you don't read about anyone going through the streets of Sodom and Gomorrah telling them that the kingdom is coming and they needed to repent. No, God just saw their wickedness and destroyed them. But now you've got a chance to do something about this. And you're going to refuse this? You would be better to go to judgment from Sodom than to turn your ears away from the truth of the gospel and stand there knowing you had a way out and refused it. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Now, behold, I send you forth as sheep. There's going to be four animals here. I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Well, you know what wolves do to sheep, don't you? Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You know what he's saying, kind of like the old boy said, now y'all boys be careful out there. They're going into hostile territory and there are to be wise. That means to be careful here, but harmless. Don't go out there to hurt things. You're there to help things. But you're like going out as sheep into the midst of wolves carrying this message out. He knew what they were up against. Now he said, beware of men. They will deliver you up to the councils and they'll scourge you in their synagogues and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Whether that happened on the limited commission or not, I don't know, but I know that they entered, entered into the synagogues and hauled men and women off. They were scourged in their synagogues. And, and Paul would later stand before kings, wouldn't he, and preach the gospel. And so these things come about Maybe they came about some part in the limited commission. They come about in the great commission. But I want you to notice what he says here that, that shows that they were inspired of God. And he told them this. He said, when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it's not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. Now listen, if they told me you're going to go before the judge and you're going to, have to explain this to him, I might lose some sleep. Boy, how am I going to explain this to the judge? 
And, and not only what will I say, but how will I say it? There's different ways to say things, isn't it? I mean, sometimes you just want to just plain spell it right out boldly, maybe even with anger. And sometimes you want to say things just very mildly. And, yet, and how's the best, what's the most effective way to communicate this message? Well, both the message and how to say it would be given them in that hour so they didn't have to worry about that because the Holy Spirit would be with them as they stood there in the judgment of men. But watch what's going to happen. The brother shall deliver up the brother to death and the father the child and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye to another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Don't just stick around where they don't want you. Once you've done this, they don't want it. Go, go where someone will listen. Go somewhere else. You're not gonna get it all done before I come. And he says, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Beelzebub? That translates Lord of the flies. Well, Remember how the Pharisees were saying he cast out devils by the prince of the devil? That all ties together here. If they're going to blaspheme me and call me ugly names for doing what I'm doing, what do you think they're going to do to you? All right. Fear them not, therefore. For there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, nor hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. What you hear in the ear, that preach ye from the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. For rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I tell you, the people can take your body and can kill the body. You never read about anybody killing a soul, do you? The soul lives on. And the spirit returns unto God who gave it. On that great day of resurrection, we'll receive a new body, incorruptible. But to some, it'll be a vessel of honor unto honor and some a vessel fitted for destruction. And that destruction, that means you're going to be ruined. That's the kind of destruction he's talking about. Both this new resurrected body and your soul in hell. That's who to fear. Don't fear those that can just take this physical life. Beware those that bring you into spiritual death. Now, God knows, and he knows what we're going through. Are not two sparrows sold for a tithing? That's like, we can buy two of these little birds for a penny. And if one of them fall to the ground, and one of them fall, shall not fall to the ground without your father notice. I talked to the kids this morning. You ever been driving down the highway and hit a bird? Well, you hate that, don't you? Did you know God hates it too? He knows. That little bird, he, he knows the whole life of that bird. And oh, you know, we've lost a bird. <laughs> and God cares about those little sparrows. And he cares more for you. Don't think God doesn't care for you. But it says here, the very hairs of your head are numbered. You see a new mama looking down at the little baby's head. I mean, just looking at that head. And just look at all the hair on it. But she can't count them. No, oh, there's more than you can count. But God knows how many you have. I, he knows how many we've lost, men. Okay? He knows the count. And that's how much God cares for us. He cares for us so much. 
just like a mother with her little child, he, he counts each hair. And he knows that much about us and cares for us that much. And then he says, fear ye not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I've come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foe shall be in their own household. And then here's the importance of following Christ. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You know, that is a natural affection you have for your parents, don't you? You just love them because they're your parents. And it's that, but you've got to love God more. And then he says this, he that love a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. How much you love those children. There have been people that would not be baptized into Christ because mom and daddy weren't. And you've got to love God more. And there have been parents that have left the faith because their children did. But you've got to love God more. He said, He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Is this going to be hard? Yep. All right, if it's going to be hard, then we're going to go at it hard. We're going to take our cross and follow him and put that above all things, even above our own life itself. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me. He that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in, a prof in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only. In the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. We sing that beautiful song, don't we? If just a cup of water I place within your hands, then just a cup of water is all that I demand. And every little thing we do, sometimes we get all worried, oh God knows every little bad thing I've ever done. And, and that's worrisome. That, that worries you. But he also knows every little good thing you've ever done. Every little cup of cold water, God takes count of it all. And he forgives our iniquities, but he does not forget the acts of kindness. And so, there we got it. That's a lot of ground. But I'll tell you, I want you to enjoy reading this. Read Matthew 9, 14 through 10, 42. If you'll read it tonight and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, then you will have read it five times, counting the time we just read it before the test, and it'll help you, okay? And then keep reading it till the Bible bowl. These kids, look what we're asking them to do. From Matthew chapter 6 through 11 <laughs> in that Bible bowl. And so this is just a small portion of that. And so there's a lot to cover. And so uh, we want to help them and encourage them all we can. So be ready for that test. And then I want you to think about what we've talked about tonight. Matthew's writing this that we might believe Jesus is the Christ. And when Jesus spoke, he spoke like he was the Christ, didn't he? He did. I tell you, anybody come up and tell me, you got to love me more than your mom and daddy. I say, who, who is he to say something like that? Someone says, you got to love me more than your children. I'm thinking, now what? How can anybody say that? The only way anybody can really say that with any significance is that's the Christ. That's God in the flesh. And that's why we would do that. And so he always spoke just like he was the Christ, didn't he? And he performed the miracles that even the Pharisees could not deny. 
They just attributed it to the power of the devil, but they couldn't deny that the miracles were done. And so we need to follow Jesus, take up our cross and follow him. Be baptized into Jesus Christ. Rise out of that water and walk a life that brings him glory all the days of your life and go into that heavenly home that is promised us. There is our hope. So if you need to do that tonight, do it while we stand and sing.